In the late 1980s, the Miramichi, New Brunswick, was renowned for its natural beauty, as well as the welcoming warmth of its residents. Miramichi is mostly a rural area, very friendly area. Even we get new police officers here, they comment their arms get worn out from having to wave so often because the people are so friendly. You know, it was just an ordinary community. It had its uh, beautiful sights. It had the famous uh, fishing rivers known all over the world. Very quiet little town. People didn't lock their doors. And most kids went outside to play. But in October 1989, this peaceful, child-friendly community was engulfed by fear. There is no trick or treating in Newcastle tonight because this Halloween is like no other. A masked killer had forced the residents off the streets. You can't go out at night by yourself. And like, I never used to be scared to be home by myself, and now I'm scared. The nighttime prowler had invaded people's homes and brutally ended the lives of three local women. At night, people wanted to protect their family. Gun sales went way up. Despite a huge manhunt, the killer had evaded capture for over six months. The mood and the atmosphere was something that I've never seen before. He had the whole Miramichi area in total fear. With seemingly no end to the bloodshed, petrified locals in Chatham Head would turn to the church and the comforting words of Father James Smith. Father Smith was very well regarded in the community, very well known for his, uh, his kindness. He's a Roman Catholic priest in a Roman Catholic community. He lived in the rectory right next to the church. The church was right next to my grandmother's house. He was a significant figure in that community. However, concerns would be raised one November night when the local priest failed to show up for a prayer meeting. The parishioners went over to the uh, rectory to see uh, where he was. And they looked in the windows to see if uh, they could see anything. And they saw his body on the floor, saw scenes of a struggle, and lots of violence in the house. Officer Mason Johnson would be called to the scene. As he entered the rectory, the full extent of the attack was plain to see. I arrived at the scene, and he was lying there, and he was tortured. His neck was cut, his chest was cut, his jaw was broken. They found uh, just an exceptional degree of violence, and they found uh, Father Smith badly beaten, and he had uh, expired. An autopsy would later reveal an even more shocking aspect to the killer's attack. He had jumped on Father Smith and separated the ribs from the sternum. To uh, attack a clergyman in the middle of a small community like this and for someone to come into his home and subject him to absolute violence and torture I think any investigator really believes that this thing has gone over the ledge and, and really there's no turning back now for whoever this is responsible for this. Many of these people will barricade themselves in their homes tonight, praying for the nightmare to end. As police took on board the fourth murder to hit the Miramichi in just six months, the sadistic nature of the crimes left them in no doubt what they were dealing with. This person would have to be an animal. This person would have to be a person without any conscience. And one name stood out above all others, a 41-year-old prisoner on the run, local man, Alan Legier. You mentioned Alan Legier. Everybody in the memory machine knew the name Alan Legier. He was violent. And sometimes it could be utterly unpredictable. It's fair to assume that if anything bad happened, Alan Legier was part of it, or people said he was part of it. 
and three years previously, the notorious Legier had been involved in a similarly brutal attack inflicted on elderly storekeepers John and Mary Glendenning. The culprits had gone into the home and beaten them as part of a robbery. This was a robbery, obviously, that had gone bad. Legier and his two accomplices had remained in the couple's home for a number of hours. Tragically, the brutal onslaught led to the death of John Glendenning, whilst his wife was left with horrific injuries. If you could have seen her face and the beating that she took, I've never seen a woman display as much courage. She went through a torture and a sexual assault. She was basically on her deathbed when she was brought to the hospital. Although three men had been implicated, 38-year-old Alan Legere was identified as the ringleader with two young accomplices. These young fellows weren't known for the violence that Legere was known for. It's not the kind of thing that 18 and 19-year-olds would do. Even if they were after money, it went beyond what any kind of like small-town criminal would be doing. Legere was seen as the instigator the leader, probably the planner, an older criminal working with two younger criminals. Alan Legere was sentenced to life in prison. Once inside, he appeared to be willing to conform. Very quickly, Alan Legere became a model prisoner once he got inside prison. No muss, no fuss, no trouble. But despite his placid demeanor, Alan Legere was not intending to spend the rest of his days behind bars. He observed the place, but most of all, what he did was build a rapport with the guards. He was seeding the ground. He was looking for an opportunity where he could try to make a dash for it. In May 1989, Legere put his master plan into action. He took urine and he lay down and he put the urine in his left ear and his ear would get infected. So he eventually had to see a specialist. Now to see a specialist, he knows he has to leave the institution. Prison guards would accompany the notorious killer to a hospital in Moncton. He had it all planned. He had the antenna from his television snapped off, hidden inside a cavity in his body. He had a makeshift key. He had a jacket that he was carrying to hide where his handcuffs were. He was able to loosen his feet shackles and his handcuffs, but they did look like they were still on. When Leger arrived at the hospital, he created an opportunity to separate himself from the accompanying guards. He says, I've got to use the bathroom. He could convince them to let their guard down so that they would give him just that inch of leeway. Of course, when they get in the washroom, it was only 10 seconds to take his handcuffs off. Having freed himself, Legere then extracted the television antennae from his body. He came out of the washroom, waving the TV aerial at the two guards like it was a weapon. They don't have guns. All they've got is a bit of tear gas and a canister. And by the time they realize what's happening, he's headed out the door, and they're trying to spray the back of his head with the tear gas. It was all planned. As Legier attempted to flee the scene, he hastily made his way through the hospital car park. The first car he came to belonged to outpatient Peggy Olive. Well, it all happened so quickly because he just uh, opened the door and pushed me over. He said he was being held for murder and the fact that he was holding something to my throat, and I thought, this is the end of my life. And everything sort of flashed through my mind. Despite the situation, he doesn't seem to be running on adrenaline. He's running at a very calm pace. That's not what a normal person would be able to do. With Legere at the wheel, Peggy would see more than one side to the convicted killer during her terrifying ordeal. He'd be a bad guy, like threatening, and then he'd be try to be the nice guy. So his personalities were changing constantly. I felt he was capable of anything. Despite her concerns, 
the carjacking would end without bloodshed. When he did let me go, he said, uh, oh, and I won't harm your car either. There was a feeling, he just exuded evil. It was this terrifying feeling you had. Even now, I can recall how I felt. He gets her out of the vehicle, he takes the vehicle, he drives to a section of Moncton that he knows, he dumps the vehicle. Despite a heightened state of alert, the fugitive would vanish into thin air. As the manhunt continued, many, including Miramichi police officer Bob Bruce, were convinced he would not return to his homeland. We felt that he was so well known in this area that it would be almost like, uh, why come back to some place where I'm going to be arrested right away? The assumption was, what do small town hoods do when they escape from prison? They disappear. Little did we know that wasn't what was going to happen. In May 1989, convicted killer Alan Legere was on the run following a brazen escape from a Moncton hospital. Although his whereabouts were unknown, his homeland of the Miramichi had been subjected to a campaign of murder, fueling rumors that the fugitive may have returned to the area. Forty-one years previously, in 1948, Alan Legere had been born in Chatham Head, a troubled neighborhood on the banks of the Miramichi River. You didn't bike through there, walk through there. And it was a rough area to go to. It was poor. There were homes there where it would have been very difficult to find enough to eat. It wasn't unusual for people to struggle to get enough to just keep their house warm in the winter. As a single mother, Louise Legere rented out rooms in the family house to make ends meet. One of her lodgers would father her fourth child, Alan, before skipping town. He grew up without any kind of father influence or father figure to look up to. Alan's relationship with his mother was difficult. She was someone who wasn't terribly selective with her partners, and she would bring them into the home. And the walls probably weren't terribly well insulated. You'd be fully aware of the fact that she'd brought somebody into the house. I don't think that Ligier was a big fan of what his mother was doing. It was not something that he was proud of. Adolescent boys need to see their mothers as asexual. It is very, very difficult for an adolescent boy to see their mother having sex, even with their father. But when an adolescent boy sees his mother in a very sexual way, it's enormously destabilizing in their psychosexual development. As Alan Legere progressed through his early childhood, signs of inappropriate behavior would start to surface. He had to share a bedroom with his sister. And one of his, I think, strongest influences in his early life was watching his sister dress and undress. He had these sexual urges from an early age and uh, used to watch her undress. Outside the family home, Legere would divide opinion at school. Some people really liked him and thought he had a lot of potential as an artist. And then there's others that thought he was just a horrible thug who was always involved in fights. People who he liked felt that he was bright and had potential. People that he didn't like, they were afraid of him. Legere's troubled childhood would ultimately be forged by a family tragedy when his elder brother was run over whilst walking over a local bridge. As his mother grieved, she would launch an extraordinary attack on her increasingly wayward younger son, Alan. His mother had just told him point blank, I wish it was you and not your brother. Alan Legere's mother resented him. 
And it wasn't only his family that was growing tired of his troublesome behavior. He wouldn't have been getting a lot of positive reinforcement inside the community. I think it all just sort of weighed on him. You can see where the scars would be. Thirty-two years later, in 1989, Alan Legere was a convicted killer on the run, having escaped custody during a hospital visit in Moncton. As he continued to evade capture, fears were growing that the fugitive may return home to the Miramichi, intent on revenge. Many community people thought that Legere had a need to get back and pay people back for his conviction, feeling that he wasn't treated uh, properly. And they said, we want you to get your family and put them somewhere. But they wouldn't leave home. They said, no, if you're staying here, we're staying. Despite concerns, three weeks would pass without incident. But then Officer Mole was called to a house fire in the community of Chatham. So in 1989, this vacant lot, on the left-hand side, there would be a small grocery store and uh, on the second floor would have been uh, Annie Flam's residence. Annie had run the local store for a number of years. Annie Flam was well known in the community. Sort of local kids would go there and buy candy at the store. She was sort of everybody's grandmother. The popular 75-year-old was known to be close to her sister-in-law, Nina, who lived in the adjoining house. Annie Flam and Nina were just pillars of the community. Everybody loved them. The house fire was devastating, but despite the ferocity of the flames, Nina Flam had managed to survive. The entire house had been destroyed by fire, and it was uh, really a miracle that, that Nina herself had escaped the fire. However, the majority of her body, she was covered in second and third degree burns. Despite her injuries, Nina was able to reveal to police that the fire was not accidental. They knew from talking briefly with Nina Flam that they had a very serious assault that had taken place. A masked intruder had initially demanded money, but had then subjected the elderly women to a prolonged attack before setting the building ablaze. Nina Flam, he had tied her to the bed, strangled her. She had feigned death. So he left her for dead, and she was able to get her restraints off her feet. Her bed was totally engulfed at that point, and the room was in flames. As investigators headed to the burnt-out first floor, they feared the worst for Nina's sister-in-law, Annie Flam. Her remains were found in her bed with the covers tucked in. Didn't look as if she had gotten into bed voluntarily, it rolled over, you know, like you'd normally it would do, you'd go to bed. She was, had been tucked in by someone. She had been brutally assaulted before, before the fire. The subsequent autopsy revealed that she had been beaten, uh, her jaw was broken. The 75-year-old had also been sexually assaulted before her death. She had expired on her own vomit because of the trauma of the injury. She did not die from smoke inhalation. It was actually the assault. For no rhyme, no reason. We could figure out why anybody would go in. We could figure out maybe in to rob them, but not to commit the violence against them that, uh, that was uh, so apparent. He's targeting elderly victims because they're weak and they have very little ability to resist. That shows just how weak and inadequate he feels internally. The profile of the elderly victims and signs of theft at the scene bore the hallmarks of the Glen Denning murder committed by Alan Legere three years previously. We knew that he had escaped, but we had no evidence uh, to say that he had actually come back to their area. However, investigators would be forced to reevaluate when victim Nina Flam recalled a particular detail from her terrifying ordeal. 
her attacker had worn a chain around his midriff. A belly chain or a waist chain is uh, it's consistent with a prisoner. In the back of, I think, all of our minds, Legere was the prime suspect. But without a single sighting, authorities had little to go on. As they desperately searched for leads, they were unaware that the bloodshed in the Miramichi had only just begun. In May 1989, the Miramichi suffered the brutal murder of 75-year-old storekeeper Annie Flam. With escaped killer Alan Legere rumoured to be in the area, fears were growing that the sadistic killing may have been the start of a random revenge campaign against the local community. A lot of people thought, well, did I ever make him mad? You know, he might come looking for me. He was out to hurt a lot of people in this area. I have one son and three daughters, and they were very intimidated. Despite a heightened state of alert, the local terrain would hamper attempts to track him down. I think the challenge for law enforcement in this area is that there's very dense woodland around the, uh, the communities themselves. The surrounding area is all something like this. So all our searches took us to areas that were very difficult to search. Although there were still no sightings of Legere, Many believed the convicted killer was stalking the neighborhood under the cover of darkness. Part of the community sense of what Legere was was that he was almost like the boogeyman. People had to be careful what they said because they never knew if he was listening or not. I could just feel Legere behind every bush. There's, a, there's Legere or... Just looking into the forest, you think, is he there somewhere, watching like a specter, ghost? He's out there in the woods. It was along that time frame when we were also starting to get some prowler complaints. And one disturbed break-in offered up evidence that would be hard to ignore. A gentleman came home, saw someone running through his backyard. He chased him. However, he was able to escape. The next day, the owner of the home went out and found a pair of eyeglasses. We recovered them. They were prescription glasses, and they matched up to the same prescription glasses that was here had been issued in prison. Decades earlier, Alan Legere had been renowned as a wayward teenager in the Miramichi area. But despite his rebellious image, Legere felt his diminutive stature was holding him back. He was small and he was skinny. And in a neighborhood like that one, if you were a bit lippy and talked too much, somebody would give you a slap upside the head. There was only one way to avoid that, which was to be big enough that they didn't dare do that to you. Bodybuilding would fast become one of Alan Legere's lifetime passions. He went to the gym pretty well every day. He was very muscular in his upper body, and he would walk around with a T-shirt on or a little undershirt or no shirt. He had the particular way of walking, chest out, had that bodybuilder walk, and he made sure people knew who he was. He wants to demonstrate to others how powerful he is, but he also wants to demonstrate to himself that he's not the weak, inadequate, inferior person that he really knows internally that he is. Behind the scenes, Legere also took great pleasure in his own brand of petty crime. He prided himself of being able to go into a house or a trailer with the people at home and steal what he wanted. There were stories of people waking up and he was standing over them in the bed. Basically, just looking at them. Those who didn't wake would soon find out Alan Legere had paid them a visit. He'd always leave something behind to let the homeowner know that he had been there. 
a takeout clothing and leave on the bed on top of the people that were sleeping. He even cut the underwear off a female minister. He was quite proud of being able to do things like that. He enjoyed feeling control and power because he didn't have much else. He didn't have the breaks in life that the, the Richies, as he used to call them, had. Although Legere would live away from the area in Moncton, the focus of his crimes would remain on the Miramichi. As his break-ins escalated, police would find him hard to pin down as he went to extreme measures to cover his tracks. He would take a hard-covered book, put it in the living room on the carpet, reach underneath and light the pages on fire. So that would work as a downdraft, like almost like a stove. And he could take an hour and a half to drive from here to Moncton before the fire department got a call that the house was burning. And if they checked him in Moncton, two hours later, they're saying, but he's here. Seven years later, Alan Legere was a convicted killer on the run. Although he hadn't been cited, police suspected Legere had returned home on a revenge campaign and was potentially involved in the Chatham murder of 75-year-old Annie Flam. People did not want to talk about Alan Legere. They were scared if they said something to me, that they were going to get targeted. They did not want their name to appear in print, ever. You could have a sighting of a prowler two nights back to back, and then there'd be a time frame of two weeks that there'd be absolutely nothing. And it was almost like a game for him. He became a master at eluding us. For over six months, the Miramichi would suffer just minor crimes. But that would all change on the night of the 13th of October, 1989, in the community of Newcastle. Someone was walking by and saw flames coming from the home of Linda and Donna Donnie. Linda, 41, and Donna, 45, were both popular members of their close-knit community. The Donnie sisters were an unmarried pair of sisters that uh, lived in the former town of Newcastle. Having investigated the arson attack and brutal murder carried out at the Flam residence, Officer Mole would try to remain objective as he approached the scene. They notified us that they had had a fire, that there had been casualties. You don't want to jump straight to the fact that this is another homicide case tied to the one in Chatham. However, when the investigator entered the building, the horrific scene that lay before him left little doubt that the twisted killer had struck again. I went inside. Just the degree of violence throughout the house was just incredible. And they find one body, and then they find another body, and then they look around and they see, you know, there's blood everywhere. The fire police say was deliberately set to hide evidence of a grisly double murder. The attacker had gone into the house, had brutally beaten both of those girls, had sexually assaulted them, badly, badly beaten, broken bones. The cause of death was strangulation and blunt trauma caused by severe blows to the uh, to their head. Yeah, I saw both Donnie sisters' photographs. Wow, scary. That somebody could do that to someone. This is the man everyone is afraid of finding on the doorstep. You just wonder, how could somebody be so aggressive and brutal to other people, way beyond what is necessary to kill the person. He wants to destroy things. He wants to destroy people. If someone had a house or an attachment to the house, destroy it. The DNA analysis identified uh, Alan Legere, that it was his genetic material that was left at both of those uh, crime scenes. And with no specific vendettas against the victims, it appeared that anyone in the Miramichi was a potential target. It was that moment with that report, I think, that we began the descent into what would be full-scale panic. Alan Legere is to be considered one of the most dangerous and wanted criminals in Canada. 
everyone knew that Alan Legere was out hunting after dark. They were scared of prowlers, so your normal streetlights, which are pretty well on every second corner, people were actually hiring streetlights in front of their home, behind their home, so that their home would be totally illuminated in the darkness. The lights got nicknamed Legere lights after Alan Legere. I used to put sticks in my windows, so you had to break glass to get in my house. A couple of times, police officers showed up on my lawn with dogs, and they said the dog trailed them right to my back door. A massive manhunt would focus its search at night, but Legere's knowledge of the area made him an elusive adversary. These wooded areas are, were sort of like Alan Legere's playground. He was very familiar with them. This is the areas where he grew up in. We would come to a fence like this where we would have to climb over it. He always seemed to know where the holes were in the fence line so he could go through it. On a rare occasion, when Officer Bruce came close to capturing the fugitive, he discovered they were dealing with an armed assailant. It was one of the darkest nights I can ever remember working. It was pitch black. And we were actually at a run down these tracks. We must have got fairly close because we heard a gunshot and, and at the same time saw a muzzle flash. And we immediately dove off this track bed into the, the ditches on both sides of it to, to avoid being shot at. After the first shot was fired, it was just duck and continue running. The second one was duck and don't get back up because we could not see anything to hit, to even shoot at. It was like we were chasing the ghost. It was like he could see us somehow and we couldn't see him. As the killer disappeared into the night, many felt he was in complete control. I think there was a sense in the community that Alan Legere was rubbing his hands in glee, that he had us where he wanted us. As the search continued, those who had lived alongside Legere in his adult years would recall more than one side to the former Miramichi resident. He had a personality that seemed to draw people in. I've talked to many, many people over the years that met him and say, my God, was he ever nice. He helped with the dishes and he was just the nicest guy in the world. He was a little bit dangerous, a little bit exciting. He married, he had kids. It looked like he was going to somehow find his way into sort of at least the lower middle class. And yet he couldn't seem to hold that together. He wanted to be perceived as someone strong and powerful and competent. And he tried to even convince himself of that. But his feelings of inferiority were just too overpowering for him. And so he constantly tried to compensate Increasingly out of work, Alan Legere would look to make his mark in other ways. I think if you're a reasonably bright person who's stuck on the wrong side of the tracks and you're looking for a way to sort of right that wrong, if you become known as fearsome, that gives you the right to swagger into a room. And I think Alan Legere desperately wanted it and he'd found an avenue that allowed him to become the person inside the community that he felt he always should have been. He definitely wanted the, the community to know who he was. He had very piercing eyes. And when he talked to you, he liked to get right up close, which would intimidate you into stepping back a step. He was unpredictable in a way that people didn't understand. And once he went off, there were no limits, there were no bounds. Legere's animosity would become increasingly extreme as he targeted other elements of the Miramichi community. He expressed his disdain for the Catholic Church, and then he would go on about the gold, the wealth of the Catholic Church, and then he would scare me. He would go in quoting verses, uh, satanic verses. Oh, it chills up my back. Three years later, in December 1989, Father James Smith would become the fourth victim of a sadistic killing spree. Having linked Legere to three of the murders, police were convinced the fugitive had perpetrated the latest crime. 
we were sure at this particular point that when the priest was killed, there was no doubt that Alan Legere was responsible. It just seemed like this was the ultimate crime to really punish the community for whatever reason. After the killing of Father Smith, there was a recognition that we were the hunting ground, that he was hunting us. And as before, Alan Legere had disappeared without trace and was free to kill again. In 1989, escaped fugitive Alan Legere was the prime suspect in the murders of four Miramichi residents. Having evaded capture for more than six months, the elusive killer had just fled the scene of Father Smith's murder and was known to have boarded a train to Quebec when it was searched by police. The police did walk up to him and they were told to look for a tattoo of an eagle on one of the shoulders. They asked him if he would mind rolling up his sleeve. And in that supernatural calm that he seemed to be able to call upon in situations like this, he pulled up his sleeve, there was no eagle on his arm. They had the wrong arm. Having foiled authorities once more, the fugitive had freedom in his sights. He made it to Montreal, and he managed to pawn off some jewelry that he had stolen from the Donny sisters. You know, he, he had money now, so where was he going to go? But despite the obvious risks, Legere then made an extraordinary U-turn. Most people you think in his situation would just keep going, try to get out of the country, but why would you want to even just think of going back to the Miramichi. But Alan Legere doesn't think like other people. He hijacked a trucker and headed uh, east, which is back towards the Mir Miramichi. And so everybody was made aware. We did have roadblocks set up with the RCMP. It was one of the roadblocks that actually caught him. Although Legere had eventually been cornered, he was holding the truck driver captive at gunpoint. There was a discussion that he would fight to the death. And I said, no, he's a coward. He's going to give himself up. Al Najir comes out of the truck and basically says, yeah, it's me. You got me. He surrendered quietly, meekly. No muss, no fuss. Najir only wants to display his violence and aggression where he knows he can win. He'll do it with an elderly woman or someone who's weak and um, disabled in some way, then he'll show how violent he is. But with armed police officers, no, he'll just give up and end it right there. News of Legere's arrest would offer huge relief to the Miramichi community. It was like a dream come true. Finally, he's in custody. And there was really, there was jubilation after he was taken into custody. Partway through the day, I heard church bells ringing, and I realized that the church bells were ringing not because it was noon, but because Al Najir had been captured. It was a huge relief. It was a huge relief to me. Like, that's the happiest story I ever wrote uh, in my life. Two years later, Alan Legier would be found guilty of four counts of first degree murder. The witness statement provided by survivor Nina Flam would play a major role in his conviction. Anyone listening to her testimony really felt for the situation that she was in, not only that night in that room, but what she's suffered since and how she's had to deal with it. As life finally returned to normal for the residents of the Miramichi, many were left wondering why one of their own had waged such a brutal war on their community. Mr. Legere always thought people were out to get him. Prosecutors, police officers, the average person, that's just the way he was. He lived a fairly disadvantaged life as a young person in the community, saw what other people had, and in committing these crimes, I think he saw it as an opportunity to kind of get even.
But was it just Alan Legere's challenged upbringing that sparked his murderous campaign? Or was he born to kill? Alan Legere was born a psychopath. I think uh, it's a mental disorder he was born with, and uh, he doesn't have any conscience. Now, if we do something wrong, we've got a conscience. But Alan Legere showed no caring and no remorse. I wouldn't say he was necessarily a born killer, but he certainly had these predispositions, and they emerged. And he just felt so weak inside that he just was living his whole life to compensate for it and to let people think that he was something other than what he really is. Lots of people grow up with hired knocks in their lives, and people go through horrible things when they're young, but they don't go out and kill people. So he had to have it in him from birth to kill, because there's, how else would you explain it? Decades later, Alan Legere's reign of terror is now an horrific chapter from the past. But the community of the Miramichi is yet to erase this brutal killer from its memory. Obviously, the family members that were victims, the relatives, the, the community itself is scarred. A lot of turmoil, and they'll never forget. But as a community, we will survive and hopefully be better from it. Al Legier makes news every time his name is mentioned. He still frightens people. It's raw. They are convinced decades after he did it the first time that if he gets out, he would do it again. And those who knew him well are convinced that the convicted killer has only one thing on his mind. He called me from the pen. He wanted to speak to me. He wanted his television back. So I said, does that television been searched the way it should have been? Well, we think so. I said, well, you better search it again because there's a reason he wants his TV back. So they looked into the TV again and they found uh, a couple more handcuff keys. He started then planning his next escape. I'm sure he's thinking about it right now. I'm sure he doesn't pass a minute of his day without thinking about getting back to that community and how he can do it. In the late 1980s, the Miramichi, New Brunswick, was renowned for its natural beauty, as well as the welcoming warmth of its residents. Miramichi is mostly a rural area, very friendly area. Even when we get new police officers here, they comment their arms get worn out from having to wave so often because the people are so friendly. You know, it was just an ordinary community. It had its uh, beautiful sights. It had the famous uh, fishing rivers known all over the world. Very quiet little town. People didn't lock their doors. And most kids went outside to play. But in October 1989, this peaceful, child-friendly community was engulfed by fear. There is no trick or treating in Newcastle tonight, because this Halloween is like no other. A masked killer had forced the residents off the streets. You can't go out at night by yourself. And like, I never used to be. Right next to my grandmother's house, he was a significant figure in that community. However, concerns would be raised one November night when the local priest failed to show up for a prayer meeting. The parishioners went over to the uh, rectory to see uh, where he was. and they looked in the windows to see if uh, they could see anything. They saw his body on the floor, saw scenes of a struggle, and lots of violence in the house. Officer Mason Johnson would be called to the scene. As he entered the rectory, the full extent of the attack was plain to see. I arrived at the scene, and he was lying there, and he was tortured. His neck was cut, his chest was cut, his jaw was broken. Animal. This person would have to be a person without any conscience. And one name stood out above all others, a 41-year-old prisoner on the run, local man, 
Alan Legier. You mentioned Alan Legier. Everybody in the memory machine knew the name Alan Legier. He was violent. And sometimes it could be utterly unpredictable. It's fair to assume that if anything bad happened, Alan Legier was part of it. Or people said he was part of it. And three years previously, the notorious Legier had been involved in a similarly brutal attack inflicted on elderly storekeepers John and Mary Glendenning. The culprits had gone into the home and beaten them as part of a robbery. This was a robbery, obviously, that had gone bad. Legier and his two accomplices had... They found uh, just an exceptional degree of violence, and they found uh, Father Smith badly beaten, and he had uh, expired. An autopsy would later reveal an even more shocking aspect to the killer's attack. He had jumped on Father Smith and separated the ribs from the sternum. To uh, attack a clergyman in the middle of a small community like this and for someone to come into his home and subject him to absolute violence and torture. I think any investigator really believes that this thing has gone over the ledge and, and really there's no turning back now for whoever this is responsible for this. Many of these people will barricade themselves in their homes tonight, praying for the nightmare to end. As police took on board the fourth murder to hit the Miramichi in just six months, the sadistic nature of the crimes left them in no doubt what they were dealing with. This person would have to be an... Scared to be home by myself and now I'm scared. The nighttime prowler had invaded people's homes and brutally ended the lives of three local women. At night, people wanted to protect their family. Gun sales went way up. Despite a huge manhunt, the killer had evaded capture for over six months. The mood and the atmosphere was something that I've never seen before. He had the whole Miramichi area in total fear. With seemingly no end to the bloodshed, petrified locals in Chatham Head would turn to the church and the comforting words of Father James Smith. Father Smith was very well regarded in the community, and very well known for his, uh, his kindness. He's a Roman Catholic priest in a Roman Catholic community. He lived in the rectory right next to the church. The church was